My name is Alex Sharado. I'm a media solutions consultant at LinkedIn. Um, media solutions consultant is one of those terms that no one really understands. Uh, it basically means that I help our clients to become more efficient and more effective on LinkedIn when it comes to anything to do with communication. So how do you better position your business on LinkedIn? How do you communicate the right message to the right people at the right time using the tools available on the platform? Today, I've got uh, David Spencer Percival, CEO of Spencer Ogden. Uh, the, well, I suppose it was the first energy, all energy recruitment firm in the UK. Um, and we're going to be talking about brand, how he's built his brand. A lot of people here are probably familiar with the Spencer Ogden brand. Um, we're going to dive into you know, how that came about and, and what's behind it, really. So, um, Hello, everyone. <laughs> so David, uh, yeah. firstly, I guess, the, the logo itself, a lot of people recognize the Spencer Ogden logo. Um, it's quite, quite strong in terms of the visual. I mean, can you talk me through how that, that came about? Sure. Um, I've been involved in a, uh, a fairly big recruitment group from start up to finish. Um, and I decided I wanted to do something new. Took a bit of time off. I was a bit frazzled after eight years of uh, building a, a business. Um, and then decided to um, go into energy, which was a bit of a risk. I knew nothing about it. But I also realized that to go into a new market and a new business, I wanted something really quite fresh and quite interesting and, and quite punchy. But we also wanted to use our names as a, as a brand, which is a fairly well-trodden path in recruitment. Um, so we settled, uh, first of all, on the, on the font, which is a, um, it's actually a font from the 1920s. It was in New York. It's an industrial font. It's quite hard-hitting. It's quite punchy. Um, and it really sort of got us out there very, very early on. So that's how it started, was with a meeting with some, um, a very small uh, creative uh, company just to talk through what we wanted to do, which was high impact quite quickly. Well, yeah, you certainly achieved that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, that helped with two million quid's worth of investment, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that does help. Um, I suppose something like this is quite, it's a bit, a bit jazzy. I don't know, it's a bit of a risk in that market, wouldn't you say? Yeah, um, I'd worked in fairly standard recruitment uh, offices for quite a while. We opened 27 offices at Huntress. And they all looked the same. They were, they were okay, they were sort of fairly modern, but I wanted something completely different. I wanted to start with the brand, the website, the offices. I wanted everything we did to be fresh and new. And it, I wanted it to feel more like a, a media company or a digital media company. I just wanted it to be really, really something that was fairly hard hitting, the colors, everything. Uh, it was a huge risk for a startup, but it was something I just wanted to do. I, I felt very strongly about it and just did something completely different. And the, and the creative group that came up with it, you know, they, they, even they said, you know, this is fairly punchy for, a, for what is a, a fairly old industry energy. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a risk, but it was one now looking back was the right thing to do. I suppose looking at that as, as a, from a risk perspective and mm. going against the grain, it, do you think you'd, it would have been the same business today if you'd have picked a different logo and a different kind of brand? Um, I think the model is strong of what we do. I think the sector's quite strong and how we've uh, uh, applied ourselves to it. Um, but I think the brand has carried us, certainly internationally. When we went into Singapore and Hong Kong, it was very popular. We went into Houston. We raised some eyebrows because it, it coincides with our offices. Our offices are very, very bright. They've got AstroTurf floors. They're very, very punchy. Um, and the Houstonians are old oil and gas, sort of uh, um, like a monopoly over there, and they were a little uncertain about it. But once it's implemented the brand alongside the website, alongside the advertising, the PR, and then you get into the offices, it all fits together. So I think it, it really, really has helped the growth of the company. I mean, it's only been three and a half years, so, um, and it's come an awful long way. The thing about brands is they last a long time. Mm. Because the bigger your company gets, it gets really expensive to change a brand. So you've got to get it right at the beginning. So yeah, and, I, and it still looks fresh. It still looks good. It, 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 it should have um, plenty of time left in it, really. So yeah, but I think it definitely, definitely has helped the growth of the business. Mm. And would you say now you've built up a brand or you've built up a business, or are they the same thing? Yeah, I, I, I got asked this question before. I went out to build both. There wasn't any prioritization between the two. I knew I wanted to build a, a, a strong, um, profitable, big recruitment company very, very quickly. But I also knew that I wanted it to be different, um, and I wanted to do it my way, and I wanted to do it with a brand that was um, a lot stronger and a lot fresher, and I wanted to spend money on the brand and push the brand. Mm. So they, they just came hand in hand. It wasn't any, I didn't really prioritize between the two. I just knew, I had a vision, and that was what it was gonna be. Underlying all of this um, is a recruitment company that works on the same principles as every other fairly well-run recruitment company, in that you, know, you do a set of processes, you do them well, you'll make, you'll make some money. 
Definitely, yeah. I suppose one of the things that's quite amazing is you are only three years old now. Yeah, three and a half. Yeah, three and a half. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. Um, yeah, it's been extraordinary. I mean, we have um, 270 staff across 10 offices. It's been absolutely, you know, breakneck speed. I don't think you could build a company any quicker. I mean, we, we've just, you know, we, we couldn't build it any quicker than we have. And on that note, I suppose um, you can't hang around this afternoon because... <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've won another award. Um, <laughs> we're in the uh, uh, Sunday Times Fast Track uh, International Track, top 200. We were number five, which is quite, quite amazing. Again, for such a short, short space of time, was the first year we could qualify. So yeah, it's been it's been very very fast. It's been um, incredibly exciting, but it's such a long way to go. So yeah. we, don't, we don't really look back anymore. We're, we're we're looking to the future. So yeah. Fantastic. I suppose you mentioned you mentioned headcount. You mentioned turnover. I suppose in terms of getting people to come and work for you, do you feel that the 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 brand, the feel? I mean, you look at some of the offices. I mean, does this have a big part to play? Yeah, I, I realised um, fairly quickly that within my sector there weren't a lot of experienced recruiters. So I couldn't go out and hire 300 experienced energy recruiters because there weren't any. So I had to uh, recruit graduates. And graduates are great, they're expensive to recruit, you have to train them, you have to really roll out an academy. Um, but the one thing I did realize is the average age is 23 years old and they just don't want to work in offices like I worked in 10 years ago, 15 years ago. They want to work in Google and Facebook and it's not necessarily how much you pay them, they'd much rather work in a cooler place than they would uh, in a, maybe a city-based company for another 5,000 a year. So I just realized that to, to attract the volume of people that we needed to attract, we had to create what's called a sticky office, which is an office that people want to go to, feel comfortable going to, want their friends to see where they're working. Um, so that was quite a driver behind mm -hmm. it. And my wife designs all the offices. Um, which is great, you know, she, she designs them and we get them built around the world. Uh, they're quite complicated actually, they look fairly simple, but we strip out all of the lights, we uh, make them all like warehouses, um, they're all cabled, round tables are a unique bespoke feature, you know, there's quite a lot of work goes into it, uh, you know, coinciding with the brand. Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely attracts people and our retention is much, much lower than my last uh, uh, company, much higher retention, much lower attrition, so yeah. It, it works, it definitely works. Mm -hmm. do, do, do you see that this sort of change in the working environment is, is, is going to be something which is going to happen across recruitment in general? Or? Um, you'd hope so. I mean, as I say, when you actually, half the battle with hiring people is, well, certainly in our company, they walk through the door and you don't have to work that hard to hire them because it's a great environment and people want to work there. You know, in recruitment, you spend a lot of time in an office, hours and hours and hours a week. Um, so you might as well make it a decent place to work. Do I think other people would do it? Depends if they can afford to. I mean, this is not cheap. Yeah. Uh, it's not cheap startup. Um, but having said that, you you know you could do a lot to freshen up an environment. I think it's really really important. I do. So I hope other people start to roll out refurbishments of, of tired offices because it definitely definitely makes it a better place to attract people. I suppose it, the actual offices themselves aren't the only things you're investing in. Um, mm. you, you've you've mentioned your website previously. Yeah. You mentioned some of the, the other marketing activities you're, you're you've invested in. Um, something that you've always been the first for a lot of different channels, including stuff like moving to a cloud-based uh, technology platform. Yeah, that was a very interesting. Uh, <laughs> we were the first Bullhorn uh, customer in, uh, in the UK, and the guy flew over from Boston. And uh, I don't know, I hope he's not here today, but he's a fairly arrogant <laughs> guy. Um, and uh, he was, you know, fairly um, difficult to deal with. But I knew he had a fantastic product, and we were looking at uh, some of the other softwares at the time. And in my previous company, we'd spent so much money on servers and we had distributed system and, you know, centralized system. And this bullhorn came along and I said, wow, this is incredible. You know, you can plug and play um, as many licenses as you want or don't want and you can switch them on anywhere in the world and all your data is, is in the cloud. It just felt so right. And, and looking back, it was, again, quite a bold decision because nobody had actually implemented bullhorn and had its, its um, email system inside it. So it's a real big risk. We don't, no, we don't have Outlook servers or anything like that. Um, but it paid off. I mean, it's been a, it's, it allows you to go into any, any place anywhere in the world, uh, other than China, because it's not in Chinese, um, uh, Mandarin or, or uh, Cantonese. Um, but it allows you to go in, 5, 10, 50 people, and just switch it on and, and play, and they can access it anywhere in the world. So, yeah, that's great. And it was the first cloud recruitment system to come out. Um, everything we do is cloud, all our back office, front office, mid office, everything's cloud based. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I suppose kind of on, on the same tr track, um, technology, how has that changed within recruitment in the past? Yeah, it's not changed massively. I mean, the kit's still the kit. I mean, the screens get smaller and thinner, and, you know, 
they're white now instead of black, but you know, <laughs> there's not a lot of change as far as the, the kit's concerned. Um, the systems change, I think, um, but it's still recruitment. It's, you know, it's a set of processes. It doesn't change that much. It's just done so badly sometimes. Um, but uh, the technology is technology. It's just moved to cloud, where it was always sitting on servers. It's now in the cloud. That's the only change I can see. Telephones are different. We now use telephone systems that are um, based off of the PCs as opposed. We don't have handsets anymore. <clears throat> Apart from that, it's the same job, really. I suppose kind of looking at it from, from, the, from the flip side, I mean, obviously, I work for a tech company, LinkedIn. Um, has LinkedIn impacted the way in which you do business now? LinkedIn, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the threat to recruitment. Um, <laughs> actually, I, I, we use LinkedIn, I would say, probably first and foremost on our database secondary. We've had this conversation before. Database was everything in recruitment 10, 15 years ago. It was the value of your business was your database. Now it doesn't mean anything your database primarily is LinkedIn, and it can move with the people that move with it, which is a, a huge risk. But the upside is, of course, you can map out businesses so effectively. People can map you out as well, which is obviously where the, where the playoff is. But oh, I think it's a very powerful tool. I think it's a great recruitment tool. All of our people use it. We all have the business licenses, and we, we I mean, every time I walk around the sales floor, everybody's on LinkedIn. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a necessary piece of software that, that enables us to do our job better. The worst threat to recruitment companies is that LinkedIn can be used by internal recruitments, um, which, is, which is pretty bad for us because that dents into our market. But I'm old enough to know that the, the internal, external recruitment market is cyclical. You know, mm. every 10 years, people are doing lots of internal recruitment, and every 10 years, they're using external recruitment. So it's just a cycle that keeps going around and around. One day, a huge company will wake up and realize they're not a recruitment company, so they're why they've got 100 internal recruiters, and they'll start using external recruitment companies. So it's just a cycle. Which is, I guess, one of the good things of having a strong brand, because people will remember you, and when they do need to call someone, they're probably on the phone. Um, the, the brand is synonymous with um, price. We're known to be expensive, and we're known to be fairly aggressive, which is not such a bad thing, I guess, if you're trying to be proactive in a market. Um, the problem with recruitment is that they, it's very, very hard to work in the um, monopolized lower level, uh, lower salary markets. You have to push up um, to create a service that the, your clients are prepared to pay 20% for, otherwise you're, you're swimming in a, in a fairly shallow pool. And internal recruitment companies using LinkedIn can do the job just as good as any recruiter can. You have to define yourself with a, with a service. So our brand we're trying to push as being something that is seen as quality, expensive but find the people that you can't find where you, when and where you want to find them and as long as we can achieve that then we'll, we'll be a successful company. Mm. I think one of the big things I, I hear a lot from, from, from our clients is the fact that when they're going to market they want to have consultants who are confident about the business they're representing. Do you feel that, uh, I suppose, as a business yourself, people going to market they, they feel confident with the backing of Spencer Ogden? Is that a big part? Well it didn't at first, you know, as a startup, we went into the market with 12 people sitting around a table and a brand that everyone thought was a bit funky. So um, it's just through hard work, really, that you get that reputation. It becomes easier. It's one of the ironies, isn't it? When you set up a business, it's incredibly difficult. You can't get credit. Nobody wants to work with you. You've got no clients. You've got no database. Um, and as you become bigger and bigger and sort of, you know, uh, more powerful, you become more lazy. But actually, it becomes a lot easier. So yes, we do now attract good energy people. We now attract good staff, and the clients know who we are. So it does get easier. That competition's pretty fierce, but it's it's uh, the the brand now is known as an energy uh, brand, which after three and a half years is is quite extraordinary. And it's taken us aback in the company as well. It's been. You know, we, we can walk into a, a region or a country and people, oh, I've heard of Spencer Ogden, you've got some great offices and stuff like that. And it never ceases to amaze me when I do that. Mm. Um, and the press, the PR companies, we use very small boutique PR companies. Um, we don't use big PR companies. We don't connect the PR companies with region. We have one for Asia, one for Europe, one for um, America. Groups of five individuals in very small boutique companies, they're very cheap, they do a retainer for a month uh, at a time rolling, and you just get some fantastic press because they work so hard for you, mm. and they get you out there in your market, and that's really helped the brand as well, it's just pushing the PR as much as possible. We're doing things differently, trying to do things a bit more interesting. Mm. So again, all of this just all around the brand keeps working hard to keep the brand out there. Yeah, yeah, I suppose a really good example was when you um, had the Criminal International cover. Uh, how many years running was that? 
Yeah, well, it was a bit of an ego trip to begin with, but it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> well, we wanted to make a splash when we uh, started the company, so I thought we'd do a front page. But it was quite a nice story. We've done it for five years in a row, and it just tracked the story of a startup from beginning to where it is now, which is um, about 50 million turnover this year. I just think it was a nice story. It was for anybody to read to say, okay, that's the start, and then that was year one, and that was the problems they had in year two with cash flow, and year three was international. Um, it's just a nice story, and, it, and it, it kind of had a nice flow to it, and I think it worked really, really well. As I say, it started off as we need to make an impact, we need to show everybody that we're here, and then continued on from there. So mm. it was quite a nice, nice piece of PR. Mm. Mm. I suppose that, that, that's looking at you know, recruitment specific PR, but outside of that, I mean, you were in the Evening Standard the other day alongside <laughs> James Kahn, of all people. Oh, Arch Enemies, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. uh, yeah, Evening Standard. <laughs> You've got to be so careful with press because one of the first things I said just as a throwaway remark was that I'm an old raver and I've got an office in Ibiza. And he put that as the strap line yeah. in the front of the, the Evening Standard article. Um, yeah, the press, the PR people are always working hard to get you into the nationals. It's very, very hard to get into a national newspaper in recruitment. It's such a well-trodden part. There's not really that much exciting you can say, so you have to look at different angles. But yeah, when you get, when you get into the national press, it doesn't really help you as a business. You don't get more clients. Um, but you do get people coming to come and work for you, say, oh, I saw your article. Um, that's probably the benefit of it. Um, but there's, there's three different ways in recruitment to do PRs. In, in recruitment, internally, it's with your sector and with, with stuff that's nothing to do with you, like the national newspapers. Um, as long as you can get a balance between the three, you should get the brands fairly immersed out there. Fantastic, yeah. Uh, it's quite interesting, because I think uh, 50 years ago, you wouldn't see a recruitment company in the national press really, for, for, no. for, for stories. And the other day I was watching BBC and um, there's some people from Harrington Star today, I think, that they were actually being interviewed uh, on the, on the primetime uh, news. It's fantastic. Well, recruitment will become quite uh, an interesting topic as unemployment starts to go down and you know, the economy starts to come out of uh, uh, the recession fairly quickly. Um, so yeah, I think recruitment will be quite a hot topic. The trick is to get yourself as the spokesperson within your sector, mm -hmm. um, because then they will always come to, and David Spence first of Spencer Ogden said this, and he said that about energy. Um, that's what you want a PR company to, you, for you to do, is you're the spokesperson, so that when something comes along like that, they can say, let's talk to this company, because um, they will have a view on this particular topic. Um, so yeah, probably become more, more to the forefront. And do you think there's a fine line between the David Spencer Percival brand and the Spencer Ogden brand? Yeah, I think they are, unfortunately, um, intertwined so heavily now. Um, I think the PR company took off with the entrepreneur angle and it kind of snowballed and I've won a few awards because of the growth of the company. Um, but yeah, that doesn't, I mean, you know, my name's above the door, it's my company, so I don't see a problem with it. It might be a problem if I wanted to retire. Um, but there are lots of big companies still with the name of the owners um, and over time they, they, they become something else. But right now it is definitely, it's me and it's, it's Spencer Ogden and we're, we're on this sort of fairly, um, sort of nosebleed trajectory, really. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. I suppose um, we're going we're to open up in a minute for questions, but sure. um, before we do that, um, I mean, is there, is there one piece of advice you'd give someone uh, who has recently set up their business? Uh, gosh, lots of advice. Funding is the key thing to any business. If you're not funded properly, you can't really do what you want. Um, focus, processes, discipline. There's no shortcuts. It's bloody hard work for a long time. Um, but just do, do what you think feels right. I mean, I, I, I chose all of these sorts of images and visuals and brands just because it just felt right to me. It just felt like I wanted to do, do it. Um, I, maybe I got lucky and, and it was the right time or the right sector, but I think if, you're, if you want to do something and you feel that passionately, passionately about it, it you've just got to work hard and it will, it will happen. So uh, there's no shortcut. I can't give anybody uh, any sort of, you know, uh, a magic silver bullet that's going to make everybody you know, hugely successful. It's just, it's just hard work applied every single day um, and try and enjoy it because it goes pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, great. Okay. Well, um, I'll, I'll open up to the floor. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask David? <clears throat> Hello. Uh, it's a really good question, actually. Yeah, I did. Um, I was forced to go into energy because I was uh, restricted from going into technology. So when you sell a business, you get these massive restrictions, more so than when you leave as an employee. So I had a two and a half year non-compete with my last business. So I had a choice, either waited or did something else. Uh, I looked at a few other sectors. Um, 
at the time it was the depth of the recession, it was 2009, so everything was pretty much on the floor. I happened to stumble across energy, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I interviewed a guy who was up in Aberdeen and he was doing phenomenally well. And it just, I just realized that there was just this huge gap in the market. There were four or five very large companies operating predominantly in oil and gas. But nobody was really covering energy as a sector, as a, as a, as a, as a whole sector. Um, and they were very, very sort of, uh, well, they were, they were 20 to 30 year old recruitment companies. So it, it just, it, I just knew as soon as I looked at it in a bit more detail, uh, it was just, you know, I didn't think it would grow this big this quick. I thought I was actually going to grow a relatively small semi-lifestyle business. Uh, <laughs> but it turned out to be a little bit more than that. But yeah, just, I, I wouldn't say it was luck. I did a bit of research, but certainly wasn't looking for energy. Um, but when I, when I looked at it, I thought, yeah, that's, that's something I could do something. But I did look at a few others, but they just weren't as interesting, I guess. You must have a question, Neil. This guy over there used to work with me 15 years ago. I can't believe he's even greyer than me. <laughs> what's, the, uh, what's the end vision for Spencer Ogden? Where, where do you see yourselves being when you, uh, when, when, when you finally retire, David? <laughs> I like private equity deals in recruitment. I think, um, I think IPOs are a little bit of vanity unless you're a very, very big company. Um, I'm not a big fan of trade sales in recruitment. I think recruitment companies should be grown organically. Private equity is the most natural route where a private equity will, company will come in, buy some or all of your business, and then take you really to the next level. Um, you get some money out, which is ultimately, as a, a, an owner-managed uh, business, that's what I would like to do. But also you get investment in, and one of the key things about Spencer Ogden, we have a lot of shareholders within the company. We gave 10% of the business away fairly quickly. Um, then private equity companies come in, they buy all of those shares and they give the key management team more shares um, to allow them to move forward. Um, so I think that's probably the transaction that we'll be looking at. You need to be doing at least 5 million EBIT to do a private equity deal because they just don't, they're not really interested below that level. That takes five years. Um, but at that point, you're, you're in the game and you can do a, a decent deal, you can take some money off the table and you can carry on and, and build a really, truly global big recruitment company. So that's the plan. God, so many. Um, cash flow is really hard when you're growing fast, particularly in your contractor book. Oil companies don't like paying their bills. BP are the worst company I've ever dealt with in my life. Um, second is GE. Uh, we're talking 150 pay day payment terms, you know, like standard. So cash flow is tough because you can't grow a business without spending money. And if you're not getting money out of your debtor book, insurers hell can't put put anything uh, into your growth. We had great funding. My backer, Sir Peter Ogden, is a significant, wealthy, ultra high net worth individual. Um, but you know, we agreed that we would put in a certain amount of money. And after that point, the company had to stand alone. So I think the biggest um, challenge in the first two to three years was generating enough cash out of the debtor book to expand the business. Other than that, um, I think some of the challenges going into places like Singapore and Hong Kong, very, very difficult. America was incredibly difficult to set up a business in. I thought it'd be very, very easy, but it's one of the hardest so far. And then we've got all the fun places like Kazakhstan and Brazil to set up. So there's going to be a few more challenges ahead. But the, the way I look at it is, if somebody else has done it, we don't want to try to reinvent something. We're doing a, a path that has been trodden before. So there must be a solution to it somewhere. So all the problems that we face, somebody else has faced at some point. Um, so that's the way I look at it. They're not intractable problems, they're just conundrums. <laughs> Hello. Um, when you start the business, how many people do you hire in the first month? And what criteria do you look for in hiring? So before I set the business up, I engaged a, a very good headhunter um, and I asked them to scope the market. They came back with about 100 profiles in energy. I interviewed about 90 of them of which I thought about 80 weren't very good. Um, the 10 that I thought were very good, I hired them, um, and we set the business up with those people. Then we started rolling the Graduate Academy every three months. We now do a Graduate Academy every two weeks. So, um, it, but in the first year, it was four Graduate Academies and some experienced recruiters who knew about energy. Um, and most of them are still with me now, a few have gone. 
Um, but that was how we started the business. I didn't know anything about energy. I knew about recruitment, but I didn't know anything about energy. So I had to hire an oil and gas guy, a power guy, a nuclear guy, and all that sort of stuff. So that's how we did it. But it took three months for the search to get to the point where I could start the business with 12 people. Um, that, and that was, that was fairly intense, as well as setting up all the offices and designing all this stuff. So yeah, it's pretty mad sort of three months. Good time. Good fun. Sorry, I'm a little bit deaf, I can't hear you, sorry. <laughs> yes, days by second, yeah. The interesting thing about Bullhorn is that the email system is inside the database. So when you email a candidate, it logs it onto the database. So you don't have to worry about people manually putting in notes. Um, I'm a big believer in systems. All of our KPI information comes off of the systems, and everyone is monitored on, the, on that information. The problem with LinkedIn is it doesn't really connect with Bullhorn, although there are some tools that allow you to drop and drag stuff that LinkedIn don't want. I don't need to know. <laughs> but they are those tools, you know, and, and who owns LinkedIn? You know, my argument is that if I'm sitting there paying someone eight hours a day to extract information from LinkedIn, I own that information. LinkedIn will argue they own it, but we, we shall see. Um, but the point about it is, I think it's very, very important to... <laughs> All right. <laughs> I think LinkedIn's amazing. I just don't know who owns it. Um, we, uh, we, we try as much as possible to keep data up to date. The problem is, of course, you've got thousands of really crap CVs coming in all the time which you have to pass on into the system. You've got rogue consultants that don't want to put information on the system. Nothing's going to change in recruitment terms. You can do as much as you can with software and drive it with management team as much as you can, trainers as much as you can, indoctrinate people to use the system, but you will always have that gap. Um, you just have to do as much as you can. But I'm a big, big believer in systems work because that really is, is, is a commodity in a business. And also legally as well, just for the point of, of, of you have any problems legally with a client, you have a, a whole backlog of information because we quite aggressively follow up behind our backs, we call it, which is a, a we generate 100,000 pounds a year in lost fees from clients who have taken people directly. And you can only enforce that if you have a database up to date. So I think it's critical. Did you, there was a guy over there who wanted to yeah, talk to you. Um, just interested, you, you mentioned that you've now got a number of international offices, which um, I just wanted to find out when, the, the, the strategy for doing that. Um, did you initially sort of do that from the UK to test the market, or did you just sort of take a punt and open um, up an office? It, it evolved, actually. We set up in London, we set up in Aberdeen, and we set up in Glasgow. Glasgow is not a centre of energy, um, but there just happened to be a particularly good team there that were, were doing oil and gas in, in, in Aberdeen. I set the business up. I was very passionate about renewable energy, and I wanted a, a bigger part of my business to be renewables, but it, it, it just didn't happen that way. Um, it's a small part of our business, not a big part. I think the realisation after the first year that we were doing business in the energy hubs of the world and that if we weren't there, we were never going to do much more than what we were doing forced my hand. It wasn't a, let's look at the map and stick some flags on it because we can. Um, it was more of a case of if we don't go into this region, not only will somebody else who will use the Spencer Ogden model to do what we are doing, but we just wouldn't get as much business as we were getting. So I had to go to Houston, and I had to go to Singapore, I didn't really have a choice. Um, Calgary, you know, I mean, if you've ever been there, it's freezing cold up there. I have. But it is, yeah. <laughs> and it's a very small place, but it's an energy capital. Um, it's the same as Brazil, you know, it's $80 billion worth of oil offshore. You have to be there. So it was, it was, I was forced by the market, not, it wasn't any particular plan. Thank you. Fantastic. I think that's about all we've got time for today. Great. David, thank you very much for thank your time you. today. Really appreciate that. Thank you.